My name is Maria. Life was plodding along the same old routine until one rainy Tuesday changed everything. I was holed up in a cozy corner of Joe's Cafe, nursing a hot coffee and trying to shake off the chill. The rain was relentless, and I hoped it would wash away the funk I was in after a tough critique in my fashion design class. The bell above the cafe door jangled, and in came this guy, soaked from head to toe. He looked around, a bit lost, then chose the table right next to mine. There was something about him that was hard to ignore, even though I usually kept to myself. He caught me staring, and instead of looking away, he grinned. Rough day, huh? Mind if I sit here? Go ahead, it's free, I said, trying not to sound too interested. He pulled out a chair, sat down with a sigh, and extended his hand. I'm James. And you are? Maria. I shook his hand, noting his firm grip. So, Maria, always this quiet in here, he asked, looking around the nearly empty cafe. Usually. Keeps the nosy folks at bay, I replied, raising an eyebrow. He chuckled. Well, you could do worse. But seriously, what brings you here on a day like this? Just hiding from the rain and some critiquing eyes. I'm a dressmaker, or at least I'm trying to be one. Had a tough day at fashion school. A dressmaker, huh? That's awesome. I'm in sales. Totally different world. But hey, we've all got our battles, right? Right, I nodded. His easy demeanor was a welcome change from the usual stress I faced. We ordered another round of coffee, and the conversation flowed as easily as the rain outside. We talked about everything from our jobs to our dreams. James wanted to make it big in sales, always chasing the next big deal. What about you, Maria? What's your big dream? He asked, leaning in a bit. To run my own atelier. I want to design clothes that don't just fit the body, but fit the soul too. Sounds cheesy, huh? Not at all. You'll get there. And hey, if you ever need a brutally honest opinion on your designs, give me a shout. I'm known for my brutal honesty. As the rain tapered off, we realized we'd spent hours talking. Guess it's time to face the real world again, James said reluctantly. Yeah, guess so. Thanks for the company, James. It was, surprisingly nice. Same here, Maria. Here's my number. Text me about those designs, or if you just want to escape another critique session, he said, scribbling on a napkin. James and I, we didn't waste any time. We knew we had something special, and before a year had ticked by, we were planning a wedding. It was nothing fancy, just close friends and family in a little chapel downtown. After we got married, things started moving even faster. We found a small apartment, big enough for two, and soon enough, it needed to be big enough for three. Lily came along, and suddenly my dreams of running my own atelier didn't seem so distant. James, can you believe we're doing this? A family, my atelier, it's all happening. I said to him one night as we sat surrounded by sketches and fabric samples. James was sprawled on the sofa, paper scattered around him, looking every bit the part of a tired sales manager. It's a lot, Maria. But hey, we're making it happen, right? Just gotta keep pushing. Opening the atelier wasn't smooth sailing. Money was tight, and James's income was hit or miss, depending on the month. But I was determined. I started taking custom orders, sewing late into the night while James would try and pick up extra shifts. It was a grind, but a shared one. Hey, babe, these electric bills are killing us. Maybe cut back on the late nights? James would say, half-joking, but knowing full well the lights were on for a reason. I'd shoot back, a bit sharper than intended. Sure, and maybe you could stop buying those fancy suits? James would raise an eyebrow, then grin. Ouch. Low blow. But fair enough. We both gotta make some sacrifices, huh? Exactly. If we tighten up now, think of where we could be in a few years. I'd respond, softening. I knew he was trying, but so was I, hard. As the atelier began to gain a bit of traction, my relationship with James saw more strain. We were both hustling, but our ideas of hustle looked pretty different. 
James loved his designer labels, a habit that didn't die with marriage or fatherhood. It was one of those constant nags at the back of my mind, gnawing away. You buying another watch? Really, James? I'd snap after seeing a new box on our dresser. It's not a big deal, Maria. It was on sale. He'd defend himself, his tone defensive. A sale? We need a new sewing machine. That's what we need on sale, I'd retort, frustration bubbling over. These spats became more frequent. They said money problems could break a marriage, and now I understood why. But every time I looked at Lily or walked into my atelier, I felt the fight in me burn brighter. I wasn't just building a business, I was building a future, our daughter's future. As the months rolled by, the atelier started to become what I had dreamed. Orders were coming in, clients were happy, and my little corner of the world was thriving. Life at the atelier was booming, but at home, things were starting to fray around the edges. Lily was growing up fast, already a teenager with her own ideas and attitudes about the world. She wasn't the little girl who used to play with fabric scraps on the floor of my studio anymore. Now, she seemed more interested in her phone and what her friends were doing. One evening, I overheard her talking on the phone. My mom? Yeah, she's just a dressmaker. It's kinda old-fashioned, you know? Not really cool. Hearing her say that stung more than I wanted to admit. The next day, I tried to talk to her about it. Lily, I heard you talking about my job last night. Does it really embarrass you that I'm a dressmaker? She shrugged, avoiding my eyes. It's just, all my friends' parents have normal jobs, and you're just, it's not cool, mom. Normal jobs? Lily, what I do is a profession. It's how we manage to live comfortably. Don't you think that's important? I was trying to keep my voice even, but it was hard not to feel hurt. Whatever, mom. It's just how I feel. She walked away, her words hanging heavy between us. James's spending habits didn't help matters. Every month, there seemed to be new charges for clothes or gadgets he didn't need. James, we talked about this. We need to save, not spend. Especially on things we don't need. Come on, Maria, I work hard. I should be able to enjoy the fruits of my labor. It's not like I'm blowing through our savings. He brushed off my concerns with a wave of his hand. But it's not just about you, or even us. It's about Lily, about her future. We need to be thinking long term. My voice was rising, frustration boiling over. All right, all right. I get it. I'll cut back. James's reply was quick, an attempt to end the conversation more than a promise to change. Then there were the moments with Lily that felt like trying to talk to a stranger. Lily, you used to love coming to the atelier. Don't you want to help me out anymore? I asked her one Saturday morning, hoping to reconnect. Mom, that was when I was a kid. I'm not interested in that stuff anymore. She barely looked up from her phone. I sighed, feeling the rejection. You know, I built all this for us, for our family. I thought you'd be proud. Mom, it's just not my thing, okay? Her tone was dismissive, and it felt like a door slamming shut. One day, scrolling through Lily's phone while she was doing homework, I stumbled across a photo that made me pause. It was Lily and an unfamiliar young woman, both smiling at the camera. Lily, who's this with you in the picture? She glanced over, her expression shifting to discomfort. Oh, that's just my friend's mom. But it didn't stop there. Lily started spending more time with James, often out of the house. Meanwhile, I buried myself in work, barely seeing them. I noticed more photos popping up on social media, Lily, James, and the same woman at various events and beautiful places. It became a pattern, this mysterious woman always there, smiling alongside my family while I was left out, sewing away into the night. Coming home that night felt different. The house was too quiet, and a sinking feeling hit me as soon as I turned the key in the lock. I called out, expecting to hear James or Lily, but there was no response. My heart thudded painfully in my chest as I stepped further inside. The living room light was on. I rounded the corner and stopped dead in my tracks. 
There, on our sofa, sat James and a woman, the same woman from the pictures. James, what is this? What's going on? My voice came out sharper and louder than I intended. James didn't even have the decency to stand up. He just looked at me, cold and distant. Maria, this is Helen. She's moving in. We need you to move out. The words were so blunt, so brutally delivered, they nearly knocked the wind out of me. Move out? This is my home, James. You're asking me to leave my own house? Helen smirked crossing her legs and looking around like she owned the place. Well, it seems like James made his choice, honey. Best you make this easy on everyone and just leave. Shut up. I snapped, my focus shifting angrily between her and James. I'm not talking to you. James, how could you do this to us? To your family? James stood up finally, his expression one of annoyance rather than remorse. It's done, Maria. I'm done we're done. Helen is here now, and that's just how it's going to be. I felt dizzy, the room spinning as their words echoed in my head. And Lily? Does she know about this? Does our daughter know that her father is kicking us out for, for her? James shrugged, a cruel indifference settling over his features. Lily is fine with it. She likes Helen. She understands things you never did. She doesn't want to see you anymore. That hit harder than anything. My own daughter? Siding with this betrayal? I pulled out my phone, my hands shaking, and dialed Lily's number. Lily, is it true? You really don't want to see me anymore? There was a pause on the other end, then Lily's voice, cold and distant. Yeah, mom, it's true. Helen's cool, you know? She gets fashion, she's fun. Not like you, always stuck with your sewing and clients. You're just, old-fashioned. Tears welled up in my eyes as I listened to her words. All those nights I stayed up working, all the sacrifices, it was all for her, for our family. And this was how she saw me? I hung up, my heart shattered into pieces. Helen looked pleased, her confidence swelling as she demonstratively stroked James's back, her smile haughty. I couldn't stand to be in that house another minute. I silently packed up the necessary things, my movements robotic. As I walked out the door, the sobs I had been holding back broke free. The drive to the hotel was blurry through my tear-filled eyes. Sobbing with resentment, I checked into the hotel, feeling lost and betrayed. I woke up in the hotel room feeling like I'd been run over. My head ached from crying, and my eyes were so swollen it hurt to blink. My phone buzzed with a message from Anna, my best friend who worked at a law firm. She had heard about the breakup and was checking in. Meeting Anna at a nearby cafe, I tried to compose myself, but as soon as I saw her concerned face, the dam broke again. Maria, oh my god, are you okay? What happened? Anna reached out, her voice full of worry as she grabbed my hands across the table. I shook my head, my voice a whisper. James, he's with someone else. Told me to get out of our home. And Lily, she's siding with him, Anna. Anna's face hardened. That's just cruel, Maria. You don't deserve any of this. You need to fight back, and I know just the person who can help. I blinked, taken aback. A lawyer, you mean? Yes, the best divorce lawyer in the city. I've seen him in action, Maria. He's tough, smart, and he doesn't let anyone push his clients around. I'll call him right now if you want. Do you think I can afford him, though? With everything going on? Anna waved off my concern. He's worth every penny, and I'll help you with the costs if it comes to that. No one messes with my best friend and gets away with it. Encouraged by her fierce loyalty, I nodded. Okay, call him. I want to see James regret what he's done to me and Lily. Anna quickly dialed and spoke briefly with someone on the other end. After she hung up, she smiled. He can meet us tomorrow. He said to bring anything that might help your case. The next day, meeting the lawyer felt like stepping into a new chapter. His office was stark but impressive, and his handshake was firm. Mrs. Richardson, I've been briefed by Anna. I assure you, we're going to sort this out. 
Now, tell me everything. As I recounted the details, the lawyer took notes, his expression growing more intense. Your husband's actions constitute not only infidelity, but also financial betrayal. We can fight for not only your marital home, but also adequate support for you and your daughter. Thank you, I. I just want what's fair. For me and my daughter. Of course. Now, about your financial situation, do you know if your husband has been diverting family funds for his affair? I, I don't know. I've been too shocked to look into it. We'll get on that right away. If he's been using marital assets to fund his lifestyle with this other woman, that strengthens your case considerably. After the meeting, I went straight to the bank to pull up the bank statements the lawyer requested. My heart sank as I scrolled through the numbers. The savings account that I had earmarked for Lily's education and our retirement was nearly empty. Transactions showed payments for jewelry, expensive restaurants, and trips, none of which were for me or Lily. I gasped, the realization hitting me hard. I had been robbed, blind. Back at the lawyer's office, I showed him the statements, my hands trembling. Look at this. It's all gone. He spent it all. The lawyer's eyes narrowed as he reviewed the documents. This is outright theft, Maria. We will definitely get this back. He's not going to get away with it. Before the courtroom drama even began, my lawyer tried to ease the tension and the potential fallout by offering to conclude a settlement agreement. He thought it might be best for everyone, especially Lily, to avoid the spectacle of a trial. But James flatly refused. He was convinced he could win in court and wouldn't budge. I had a heart-wrenching meeting with James and Lily right before we were set to appear in court. During this meeting, Lily dropped a bombshell. I want to live with Dad and Helen, not you, Mom. James and Helen laughed, their happiness piercing my heart like a dagger. It was excruciating to hear, but I swallowed the pain and told her. I respect your decision, Lily. The air in the courtroom was thick with tension as I walked in, seeing James sitting confidently with Helen and Lily by his side. My lawyer gave me a reassuring nod as we approached our table, ready to face whatever came our way. Remember, stay calm and stick to the facts, he whispered as we sat down. The judge entered, and the room fell silent. We are here to address the dissolution of marriage between Maria Richardson and James Richardson. Mrs. Richardson has also brought forth claims of financial mismanagement. We will proceed with the opening statements. James's lawyer was the first to speak. Your Honor, we contend that Mrs. Richardson's claims are exaggerated. My client has been a good husband and father, and any financial issues were mutual decisions. We seek a fair division of assets and primary custody of their daughter for Mr. Richardson. His words made my blood boil, but I kept my face neutral. My lawyer stood, his voice clear and commanding. Your Honor, we will demonstrate that Mr. Richardson not only committed adultery, but also deliberately misused family funds, significantly harming Mrs. Richardson and their daughter's financial security. We seek the marital home, full custody of their daughter, and appropriate financial restitution. The evidence presentation was grueling. I watched as bank statements, receipts, and photos were displayed, each one a stab at the life I thought I had. James squirmed, his discomfort visible, especially as the receipts from jewelry stores and luxury hotels were shown, none of which were for me or with me. The turning point came when my lawyer presented a series of messages between James and Helen, clearly detailing their affair and his spending on her. The evidence was damning, and even James's lawyer seemed to falter. Mr. Richardson, can you explain these messages? My lawyer asked, his tone cool. James stuttered, his facade crumbling. It, it was just a fling. It didn't mean anything. I wasn't using family funds for. Your Honor, the bank statements disagree. My lawyer interjected, showing the court the detailed transactions that James couldn't explain away. In his closing statement, my lawyer was resolute. Mrs. Richardson trusted her husband to honor their shared life and responsibilities. Instead, she and her daughter were betrayed. We ask for a ruling that reflects the gravity of Mr. Richardson's actions. 
James and Helen were silent as the courtroom buzzed around them. The judge nodded, taking in all the information, before adjourning the session. The courtroom was packed on the day of the final hearing, the air heavy with anticipation. I sat there, hands folded in my lap, trying to keep my nerves in check. James, Lily, and Helen were on the other side, looking confident and smug. The judge cleared his throat and began reading the decision. In light of the evidence presented, I am awarding the marital home to Mrs. Richardson, along with financial compensation from Mr. Richardson for the misappropriation of family assets. My heart leaped with a mix of relief and victory, but the most crucial part was yet to come. The judge continued, Now, regarding the custody of the minor child, Lily Richardson. James interrupted, standing up, with a sneer. Your Honor, my daughter has expressed her desire to live with me and my partner, which means Mrs. Richardson should be paying us child support for her maintenance. There was a murmur in the courtroom. I felt a cold wave of fear, but before I could say anything, Lily stood up. She looked straight at the judge, her voice clear and strong. I've changed my mind. I want to live with my mom. I've realized my dad used the money my mom saved for my education. I was wrong before. My mom is the best. She's smart and modern, and I want to be with her. The courtroom fell silent. James's face dropped, his smug smile wiped away in an instant. Tears of happiness and relief rolled down my cheeks as I listened to Lily's words. The judge nodded, looking impressed by Lily's courage. The court respects the minor's wishes. Custody of Lily Richardson will be granted to Mrs. Richardson. Furthermore, Mr. Richardson will provide child support payments. James slumped back into his seat, defeated. The judge concluded the proceedings, and as we walked out of the courtroom, I pulled Lily into a tight embrace. I love you so much, Lily. I'm so proud of you. As we exited, we saw James and Helen arguing heatedly. Helen's voice was shrill as she berated him. I don't need a loser, who's broke. I'm finding someone who can actually provide for me. With that, she stormed off, leaving James standing there, utterly alone and broken. A few months after the dust had settled and our lives began to find a new rhythm, a bit of unexpected news found its way to me. Turns out, James was fired from his job not long after the court's decision. He struggled to find work for a good while, which was something I heard through the grapevine. When he finally did land a job, it was as a handyman. The days of fancy suits and expensive shoes were behind him. With that chapter behind us, life in our new home felt like waking up to a new world. Mom, I was thinking. Lily started, her spoon clinking against her cereal bowl. Why don't we do something big with the atelier? Like, really shake things up? I smiled, sipping my coffee. What do you have in mind? Maybe we could start online classes, teach people how to sew and design. Share what you've taught me. It could be a whole new part of our business, she suggested, her eyes bright with excitement. As we talked, the seeds of our new project took root. We spent the weekend mapping out our ideas, turning the atelier into a buzzing hub of creativity and innovation. The next few months were a whirlwind. We launched our website, and the response was overwhelmingly positive. People from all over signed up for classes, eager to learn from us. The sense of community was palpable, even through the screen. Our lives had settled into a comfortable rhythm, filled with fabric swatches and video tutorials. The atelier was thriving, and so were we. But something was still missing, and I knew exactly what it was. One sunny afternoon, I broached the subject with Lily. How would you feel about moving to a bigger place? Somewhere with more space for both our home and the business? Lily's eyes lit up. Really? Could we? I've been saving up, and with the business doing well, I think it's the perfect time. We could use a fresh start, don't you think? Absolutely, Mom. Let's do it. She agreed without hesitation. So, we began house hunting, eventually finding a charming little house in the suburbs, with plenty of room for both our living quarters and a spacious new atelier. Moving day was a flurry of boxes and laughter the excitement palpable as we set up our new home. The house quickly filled with new memories, every room echoing with our laughter and dreams. 
The atelier, now twice the size of our old one, became a local hub for aspiring designers and hobbyists alike. Looking out over our new beginning, I knew we had finally found our place in the world. It wasn't just about surviving, it was about thriving, about making each day count.